I think I'm going to get started because we we don't have a huge amount of um, time and we've got a slightly lengthy presentation to get through um, before we then open the floor to you guys because this is you know a lot of this is to tell you what we're we're offering but also then to hear about you know your your thoughts about that and and, and the questions that you have. What we're going to discuss today, and who is going to discuss it to you? Um, my name is uh, Andy Newsham. Uh, I am the convener of the Climate Change uh, and Development MSc program, but we have other variants of it as well, PG Cert and PG Diploma. But I'm guessing most of you are interested in the, the MSc. Um, so uh, I work here at SOAS in the Centre for Development, Environment and Policy. One of the main areas that I work on is climate change uh, adaptation in the context of Southern Africa and also Latin America. Um, so I'm, uh, yeah, I guess I've, I've got some long-standing research interests in this area, and we've been really excited to try and get this new program launched for for, for some time now. So it's it's really exciting for us to see that it's all going to happen in October. So what we'll discuss today is first I'll take you a little bit through SOAS itself and why SOAS is a great place to study. Then hone in on study via distance learning, you know, how this fits, how this program fits with our um, our current offering. Um, climate change development, why would you study it? Some of the aims, some of the skill sets you get from studying it. Um, the program structures, the study options, um, the modules and dissertation study. Um, the entry requirements, fees and funding, and uh, finally, uh, the key dates. So that's what we're hoping to cover in the next sort of, well, hopefully 10, 15 minutes at the most. <laughs> I'll try and keep it quick. So um, firstly, just something about SOAS itself and what, what makes SOAS special? Why is SOAS a particular place that you would, uh, you would apply for? And one of the biggest reasons is just our regional expertise in parts uh, of the world where there are you know really important changes which are happening right now and you know that our students very uh, competitive in in the workplace so there's something about the focus that we have on on asia on um on you know uh, africa um and on the middle east for example that that means that you can pick up a lot of knowledge which is really very geopolitically relevant right now and this is reflected in, in you know, a lot of the spread of, 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 of what we do in, in our distance learning uh, work as well. We have the largest concentration in Europe of academic staff concerned with Africa, Asia and the Middle East. Um, we have very highly uh, and consistently rated a, a sort of teaching experience from our students. Um, we are the largest provider of the graduate uh, programmes um, to the University of London international programmes. We're very enthusiastic. We have a we have a, and we have very enthusiastic, diverse, and dedicated students, and we have uh, this uh, national research uh, library, which is uh, really great to have access to, from um, <clears throat> many particular study points of view. So. Um, we actually do quite a lot of distance learning teaching here as well. The SOAS is probably better known for its programs, but there are about 3,800 uh, you know, online and distance learning students uh, uh, you know, with us worldwide. We've got 25, well more now, years of teaching uh, experience with distance learning, um, covering you know, 170 countries, so that's where our intake is from. We have 19 master's degrees, we've got lots of short courses and modules, we've got an increasing number of MOOCs happening as well. So there's a huge amount happening in terms of uh, distance learning and online learning at SOAS, and it's only going to grow in the future. So there's only going to be more and more stuff that's also happening um, online in terms of what is already happening on campus. So um, give you some sense of the amount of people that we have here, because we're not um, a university which offers, um, you know, programs in, in uh, across the range of, of disciplines because we specialise in particular areas and within that particular disciplines. Um, you know, we're not the biggest of universities, but we have this massive concentration of 9,300 students who are interested in those regions. And as I say, 3,800 of them are online and distance learning, so it's it's not quite as big as our on-campus um, amount of students. But, uh, but it's 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 a pretty important part of what we do. So it's not just kind of like an add-on in a way that I don't want to be 
unkind to some some of the universities who are who are starting to get into distance learning. Um, but it's something that has a bit of a track record here and is a, is a really you know important part of what we do. It's not just as I say an add-on. So coming around to online distance learning um, and particularly what we do here in the Centre for Development, Environment and Policy. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, master's programs that we offer, you know, from agricultural economics through to environmental economics, environmental management, poverty reduction, sustainable development, and now we have climate change and development as well. So that's really what uh, I want to sort of hone in on in the rest of the talk. And I want to look at the question of why would you study climate change and development first of all? So. As I'm sure you all know, climate change is perhaps the most visible environmental problem in the Anthropocene. Um, that is the uh, sort of period of time increasingly seen as a, a geological era of, of, of time where human activity is um, the main uh, signal, if you like, in, in the geological record uh, of the day and is the main driver of environment, you know, set of drivers of, of, of global environmental change. And climate change is, yeah, it's, it's the, you know, the, the biggest of, of, if you like, of, of, those, of those changes that we are affecting in the global environment. And because of that, professionals working on environment and development need to understand the implications of climate change for development tra trajectories. Uh, you know, in the words of Naomi Klein, uh, this changes everything. Climate change poses a fundamental um, sort of problem for capitalism itself. Um, but does it? And that's where a lot of the debate lies, and that's where a lot of the questions lie in terms of thinking, well, what are the implications of climate change for development, and what would development have to look like in the kinds of uh, changing climates that we that we may be exposed to uh, in coming years? We also need to find a better balance between the um, energy development, uh, poverty and emissions nexus. And there's a lot of work going on within SEDEP and actually in other parts of SARS as well. Um, on climate and energy, which of course is is, is huge um, both for development and for climate change. From the development perspective, we have you know 1.3 billion people uh, living without access to energy. We have a further 2.7 billion, I think it is, um, whose main access to energy is, is actually biomass, which they burn. And we also have energy as um, and the the, you know, the burning of fossil fuels is. <laughs> the main reason why we are changing the climate. So if we're going to provide energy, at what cost does that come and how can we do it differently? Again, this is one of the biggest questions for, for development in the context of climate change. So climate change uh, and you know, change, the process of changing development is at the heart of the sustainable development goals. It's a huge focus for international organizations like the UN, national governments, but it's also increasingly something that the private sector is becoming interested in. So it's kind of an issue of our time. It's really important in its own terms of, you know, intellectually speaking, but also in terms of, you know, somewhere that you might try and get a job from because you have a, a expertise in, in this area. It's a really quite handy uh, thing to know and a very handy thing to put on your CV. And I wouldn't have got the job that I've got now, for example, <laughs> without my expertise in, in climate change. So. <clears throat> There's a big sort of intellectual area there, but there's also a strategic element to it. Okay, and what are the aims of the program? So what, in terms of what, what we're hoping our students will, will get from it is around um, offering critical insight into how current development models produce environmental problems, like but not limited to climate change, which themselves then threaten the objectives of development. Think of the um, you know, the planes uh, that have been unable to take off in recent years in heat waves in particular parts of North America because the tarmac on the runways <laughs> has melted you know, and, and that being it linked to, to anthropogenic forms of, of, of climate change and how our own effects on the climate are actually already threatening some of our fundamental modes of economic activity. Um, it's, it's looking at that sort of um, relationship and, and really having a critical perspective on it, which 
um, is, is, is really what um, will give you an advantage if uh, you know, we're in, in the job market um, or even for areas of further study. And that, of course, is the focus of, of the masters. We want to pose the question of magnitude of change that's required to confront problems of climate. Do we need reform or revolution um, is, is maybe at the heart of that agenda. And there's lots of our modules that speak to that question in a variety of different ways. So we want to help students to develop analytical skills to solve adaptation problems and to be able to identify low carbon development options. These being some of the, the key areas that we, of, of, of work in relation to the climate change and development uh, question. We want to um, contribute to producing the next generation of environment and development professionals, which are working on climate policy and practice. And of course, uh, we're always interested in providing the most academically gifted of students with a route into PhD studies on climate change and development, which of course is a, a field which is, which is uh, pretty well established now and continuing to grow. So we hope you've come up with this uh, of this degree with um, a bunch of new skill sets as well. If you're doing the MSc, um, then, and, and I'm guessing that most of you are interested in that, um, as opposed to our diploma and postgraduate uh, certificate options, um, we would think that you would be coming out with, well, you would be coming out with uh, research design, project management, analytical, and writing skills because of the research we have, which you, you learn more about what is the research process and you um, acquire uh, methodological expertise that would help you identify uh, a question, a research question, and then um, see how you might answer it and what methods you might use to do that. We'd want you to come out with capacity for reflective independent learning, um, for communication of complex ideas, for intercultural awareness and sensitivity, uh, flexibility and ability to manage complexity, your online networking skills, you're already doing it, <laughs> and um, ability to analyze and identify the relevance of knowledge acquired through study to real world change and development problems. So there's a, a lot of stuff here which is not necessarily even about climate change, um, which is going to be useful in a wide um, variety of different contexts, albeit that you know, intellectually, we're, you know, we're going to be focusing, focusing that around climate and development issues. OK, so let's get down to sort of brass tacks and some of the um, questions about how it works. As I've mentioned, we have these different levels of study. We have the postgraduate certificate, um, which if you were just after one of those, um, say you were in a job where you had to show that you would learned a particular set of skills and a particular you know sort of expertise if you like um, you might want to go for this and, and then you can gain promotion within your organization or you know for a particular job that you're going for um, you could take two modules and be finished with that in, in, in a year at, at, on the basis of part-time study a uh, postgraduate diploma is all of the, the and minus the dissertation, and with the um, the MSc comes the research component, and that's what makes um, the difference. Uh, so you could spend almost as long on a postgrad diploma as you would on uh, an, an MSc. Um, the difference being, as I say, primarily in terms of the dissertation. So, in terms of time that it would take you to do this, um, it can be anywhere between one to five years in terms of uh, you know, going from postgrad to MSc. Well, you wouldn't do an MSc in just one year, but you, the, the minimum you can do it in is two years. And that's really what we're hoping a lot of our students will do in either two or three years. There is a five year term that you are given to complete your studies, but the, the best way really is to crack on and get it out of the way uh, and, and move on and keep up the momentum from one module to, to the next. And we're hoping that the, um, the, the, the study sort of model throughout the year that we're moving to will help you to, to do that. And I'll come, I'll come back to what that looks like in terms of how we divide up the year uh, and the time within the year itself. But let me say something first about the, the modules. So the core module that everybody will um, have to take is climate change and development. 
And then we have um, a sort of list A and list B um, set up where you can choose from uh, some of, we can choose from the, from the options that, that are here that, that we have right now. And so you will choose one or two from, from, uh, from list A, and then you can choose your, let me see, I think it's, yeah, you have to choose two from list A, and then you can choose a further one from, from list B. So um, that then uh, gives you um, a, a real focus on one particular element of climate change and development, but it also allows you to look a bit more broadly to issues which you know, intersect across both development and climate considerations, such as gender and social inequality, for example, um, the political economy of public policy. It's a range of our modules which um, overlap very well with uh, some of the underlying issues which you have to understand if you want to you know get a handle on why we've got climate change and what we're going to do about it so um that's the the range of modules that we're offering for this msc and um just to clarify if you're doing the msc you'd have to take one core module three elective modules and one dissertation for the postgraduate diploma you take one core module three elective modules and for the PG cert, you take one core module and one elective module from, from list A, basically. So that's how it breaks down in terms of the, the, the options that you have to study and the structure of, of, um, of which ones you have to pick. OK, so um, the study session structure itself is two weeks, uh, sorry, it's two terms, um, both of which are 16 weeks long. Uh, term one starting in October and term two in April. Uh, that, that's going to be our, our uni sort of um, set up. And between that, you'll have these eight week breaks, which, you know, they're, they're sort of downtime, but they're also, if you're doing the MSc, um, partly uh, to give you some time to free up some time for dedicated uh, dissertation study. And we will study one module per session over that 16 week period. So, this is what it looks like in terms of a, the scope of a year. So if you look at subject module one there in the top right sort of uh, quadrant of the of, of this uh, circular diagram, that's our term one. Um, so say if you were starting this year, you'd be doing climate change and development core module then. And then you'd be getting a bit of an introduction to dissertation study. There is a MOOC that we uh, offer here at SOAS, which covers the basics. It's like a sort of research 101 kind of uh, how would I come up with a research question? Um, what are the ways in which I might be able to answer that research question? Just to get your head around what it is that you would be, you would be asked to do as part of a dissertation. And of course, you can also start to do this anytime you want um, during the first um, you know, the, the first sort of study session, but that's the time when it's dedicated for, for, for dissertation study. So then um, in um, that would run from basically your, your first subject uh, study session would run from October till February. And then you would start work again in your in your second one in April. And that would work that would um, uh, run through then um, until um, I think it's gosh I forget my head around this new model myself but I think it's I think it runs through then to June or July so it's a, it's a, it's another 16 week session and uh, followed again by dissertation study in which you would then start to look more seriously at research methods training. So by this time, you hopefully have some idea of what you want to do. What is your question? What is the gap you'd like to contribute to in terms of our, you know, the gap in our knowledge? And the research method is, is really helping you figure out how you would do that. How would you be able to um, robustly um, address or contribute to the answering of, of, of a question? And you've learned some of the research training there with an idea to developing a, a much um, more specific plan of what your dissertation would be about, which is your assessed proposal. So you then move on in 
uh, your second year, and again, this is presuming that you choose to do all of this in, in two years, and this is what a lot of our students we anticipate will do, and, and what a lot of the students who study on this particular model here at SOAS, um, you know, they tend to finish in, in, in two years. So um, you then go on and do your, um, your other two school in the third study session in February and, and then the fourth study session starting in, in, in April and uh, in between those two periods you would actually be embarking upon your dissertation research and then be looking to write it up. So that's that's the idea of, of how it's going to work um, over, over two years. I mean you can defer, you do have the option to do that if um, if, for example, you know, work is a little busy and it's a, it's a bit too much to get it in within two years, then there is the option to take uh, more time to do that. But in the down periods of time, you know, uh, of eight weeks between these two large 16 week uh, sort of study periods, uh, hopefully also there's, you know, there's, there's time to be um, keeping up to date on your, on your day to day stuff. Um, and within the 16 weeks as well, <clears throat> there is, you know, there are you have to sort of, um, you have to get through particular tasks at, at particular times. Um, but of course, because it's staged over the 16 weeks, you won't, you know, you'll have to find effect essentially maybe 15 hours per week, say. And um, that is, uh, that that's something then that, you know, you can see how you might fit it into a, a broader sort of timetable or you know, to, to, to other commitments that you may have. So, Hopefully that gives you some sense of how it would work for you uh, in, in terms of fitting with what you're already doing. Um, in terms of module study, um, I wanted to take you through a little bit what, what it would be that you'd be expected to do. We've started to spell this out, but you have um, the modules broken down into 15 units to be studied each week. And the study will consist of reading the study guide itself, which is like a, a guide to a particular area um, you know, climate change and development or energy and development or the political economy of public policy or whatever it happens to be. And as I say, you know, 15 to 20 hours of study per week will, will get you through what you what you need to do. Now, we have one times uh, one written assignment for every module, um, which is between 40 to 50 percent of the module mark. It depends on the module that you're doing and the written exam, which may likewise be 40 or 50 percent of the, the module mark. There's also an element of online participation which is 10 to 20 percent of the module mark where through um, particular discussions or particular tasks and activities that you have to do, um, you'll pick up your, your, your marks there basically. It may be for some that it's about learning how to use an online library, it may be for others that you are having a particular exercise where you review an article and you say what that article is about and you offer some kind of critical commentary on it, for example. So those are the kinds of um, activities that you will be doing um, throughout the, 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 the module itself. And as I say, this will be all supplemented by specifically written course guides, with textbooks and readings as well. You have um, a dedicated tutor and discussion forum for each module. You get access to two sets of libraries, the one at SOAS and the one at the University of London. And of course, plenty <coughs> excuse me, of opportunity to network with <coughs> other students within the context of the module itself and through the online platform. OK. So we've talked a lot about the dissertation because it's a very important component of the, um, of the MSc itself. And as I've explained it's broken down into four sessions um, and it can involve desk based and uh, or field based research, depending on what your question is and how you propose to go about answering it. You don't need to go to the field, but um, that's something that, that is an option for you if you'd like to do it. Um, and as I've, I've mainly gone through most of this stuff about, you know, you're trying to figure out what doing original research entails in year one and in year two, you're doing it and writing it up. And during that process, you will write your assessment, your assessed proposal, which is 20% of the mark. That's the detailed plan that I was referring to previously that you put in roughly at the end of the first year. And then 
you've got your 10,000 word dissertation that's going to 80 percent um, of the mark itself and again we've got lots of guidelines and lots of um, support there's a uh, a dissertation convener and there's a supervisor that you are assigned um, who will take you through the process sort of step by step and give you one-to-one -one guidance on on the, the writing of, 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 of the dissertation. Okay so um, let's talk a little bit about entry requirements then. Um, what we're looking for for the MSc is for you to have a good first degree in an appropriate subject area as accepted by the University of London. Now, there is a little bit of leeway here. I've got some really interesting people applying at the moment, and they've clearly sort of done some extracurricular um, study of their own to find out and, and become interested in climate change and development, um, even though their undergraduate um, degrees can be in, in stuff that's quite different. And if you can make a case, and presuming you've got good grades as well, that, that, that definitely helps. Um, if you can make the case that actually um, you you have an interest in this and you've got relevant work experience, for example, then even if you've studied something quite different at undergraduate, you know something that's not either say hard environmental sciences or you know social sciences related to, <coughs> to this social science, it might be human geography, you know it might be anthropology, it might be economics, um, then. If you haven't got one of those, then you can still make a case as long as your case is compelling. We will definitely consider it, and it will come to me as the convener, and um, I will be as open-minded as as uh, as I can about about seeing if we can get you on if 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 the case is made. So, if you're going for the postgrad diploma, um, a degree uh, or a technical or professional qualification and experience considered appropriate and relevant by the university is the criteria that we are the criteria that we use. And then for postgraduate certificates, um, we have sort of similar entry requirements for those for the postgraduate uh, diploma. So there may be scope for picking up. Uh, some kind of qualification in, in climate change, even if you haven't got a full undergraduate degree, as long as you have some kind of experience to supplement that with, or if you have a degree or other professional qualification, then we can very happily take that into account. Okay, um, so much for 15 minutes, but I'm almost at the end now. Um, Climate change and development fees, if you want to do the whole MSc, it's £9,500. It's cheaper for a postgrad diploma because you don't do the dissertation. And for the postgraduate certificate, it's £3,800. So you make one payment of £1,900 for each module that you enroll on. And MSc students will make two additional payments of £950 for the dissertation. So that's that's how the pricing works. And as I say, every time you sign up to a module, that's when you pay for it. So it's kind of pay it, yeah, as you learn, as, as, as it says in the slide. Um, there are various sources of funding you pursue. UK postgraduate loans are available for um, those, uh, if, you're, if you're eligible, if you've been a resident in England for three years, there's more information there. There's um, scholarships from SOAS, there is employer sponsorship. Um, you could have a look at the research councils. Overall, for everyone, there is a book which um, I should have put in this slide actually, uh, which is called The Grants Register. I'm just going to write that as a comment um, so that you've got it there. Uh, you can get it. Uh, it's just become something you can search online. It used to just be a book you had to go to the library to read. It will be in big British libraries. It will be in the, the, the British Library itself, for example. But it, you know, it'll be in the kind of town hall and city libraries uh, if you live in the UK. If you don't, there will be uh, the British Council. They, I think, they should have access to the book. If they don't, there may be other institutions, universities, for example, in your country that may have access. But the grants register, basically. Um, shows what funding is available for what kinds of study in the UK according to who you are, whether you are a British person, whether you are an international student, whether you are from particular regions, whether you have particular expertise in, in specific areas. And you can search it in, in every which way, and it's the best, most comprehensive um, <clears throat> way to figure out all of your funding options. So that's something to, to, to think about. Now, um, Key dates then, I think this is 
our final, our, our next, our nearly final slide. Um, it's the final substantive one anyway. Um, so if you are looking to get uh, your um, application in and get studying for um, uh, with us um, in October at the start date, which is the 17th of October, we need to have your application and your supporting documents by the 13th of September at the latest. We are already receiving applications and I've been processing some of them. Um, but we can still take them up to the 13th of September. After that, it may become administratively difficult to, to, uh, to, uh, to ensure that we can take on further um, students. So for this for study session two, it, looking like it'll be the 13th of March 2018, this will be the latest that you can uh, apply if you want to start um, in April. So the enrollment deadline um, will be that that's for enrolling on your modules um, will be the 3rd of October 2017. And um, we're thinking it will be the 3rd of April 2018 for, um, uh, for those of you thinking about starting next year. So yes, and just to repeat those starting dates, then you can start on the 17th of October this year or on the 17th of April 2018. So that's pretty much everything from my side. Um, now, um, the idea is to use the rest of the time as a Q&A session. So um, we can take um, questions either in the chat box itself, or we can do it uh, if you'd like to speak into the, into the microphone. Um, you can open your microphone, or you have to switch it on before you can actually speak. Um, and it's a, a little button which looks like a microphone. It's got a sort of a line through it at the moment, but if you if you have it off anyway, but if you click on it, then it will go green and you should like Adam, one of our um, uh, one of our participants here, um, he's already been able to do that and uh, the rest of you should be too. There's another little icon to the right of that, which uh, has got a little person with their arm up. I think that's the, you can put your hand up to raise a question if you want. And you can also write stuff in the chat box. And um, Beth is going to help me here by copying and pasting questions from the chat box into a, a little spreadsheet that I can see uh, so that I can hopefully um, get you some, some answers, basically. So we've got some questions already, but I think I would like to start with um, questions from people who are actually here. So. Um, who would like to ask a question? Well, I could start. <laughs> sure, Adam. <laughs> yeah. uh, will are there are there like any? Well, it's an online course, but are there any like physical meetings at, at any point? Right. So um, there can be. It depends on if you live in the UK. It's very easy to do because we are all physically here. I mean, <laughs> I say that we, we all commute into London, but um, we can very easily meet in London. You can go to the to the library, for example, and um, you know you can meet the academics who run the courses. Uh, the, the tutors don't necessarily all live in London either, and it might be more difficult to, to do. You can always write to someone and, and try and have a Skype chat with them, but of course you're talking about physical meetings. Um, the other, the other place where where you can do that is uh, <laughs> at your graduation, where we we often meet up with our students then, and that's actually sometimes the first time a lot of us actually meet. And it, you know, obviously because if you're you know living in Indonesia or something and you're studying with us, it's quite difficult to 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 get across. But if you're in the UK and you want to meet up, then send an email to the relevant academic and. You know, we can make the effort to be available and, and to ensure that we're you know, in on the same day. And you know, uh, that's the, I guess that's the, how how it works in terms of uh, the prospects for actually meeting meeting up. Okay. So there's a question about exams and are they done online there? Um, uh, so I'm just picking it up as as it is, Beth. Um, that is oh, let me just bring it down a little we do at the moment the exams will continue to be um, um, in an actual exam hall the university of london has uh, a worldwide sort of network of of exam halls that that our students go to and 
you physically go there um, to, to sit the exam. Um, and at some point in the future, uh, there is a, you know, we're looking into the prospects for, for, for online. Um, uh, but, you know, we have to be able, we have to be sure that the, that the scope for fraud is, is, is dealt with by the software. And, you know, with people being at a distance anyway, one of the good things about exams is you have to physically turn up and prove your identity. So for us, from that perspective, they're, they're, a, they're a good choice, but we are looking into uh, the software and when the software becomes compelling enough, we will be very keen to adopt it. Um, will the exams be at the end of each section or module? Yes, um, they will be a few weeks after each each module. Uh, apart from in the first year, we'll only have one exam sitting because the University of London can't organise two for the, for, the, for the first year, but then thereafter, you'll have two uh, chances to take your exams. Um, so how many students do we expect to take on this year? Well, um, gosh, there's quite a lot of questions. Um, I guess it depends, and we're hoping to get somewhere in the region of, I guess, 30 to 60 students. Um, we'll see, you know, sort of what the what the interest is, and certainly next year. We've, we've had a lot of um, hoops to jump through, which has meant that we've come to market with this course much later later than we would have wanted to. So um, it depends, but we've got about 115 expressions of interest right now, and it depends on how many of those sort of um, convert. Next year, we'll be hoping, I guess, to double the amount of people that we've, we've got, on, and you'd be joining an already vibrant sort of um, student body. So how would you be able to grade online participation if time zones are repeatedly an issue? Well, what you do is you don't have it where everyone tries to meet up like this. You have what's called asynchronous um, sort of assessment, which is where you have an online discussion forum, you have a question set, and so you have one or two weeks to deal with it, and um, so everybody deals with it in their own time, but by the end of that time, you have to have written something, and then you're given a mark on that, and you know, you have a, an essay deadline, for example, or a, you know, we, we call them exam assignments, because they can be not just essays, but they can also be PowerPoint presentations and, and other formats. Um, where you'll, you'll be told well in advance and we have discussions about how to do them. Okay, so you mentioned further PhD study. Are you planning to introduce one in the future? So um, not an online PhD. We don't have a plan at the moment to, to, to do online PhD study. Um, I'm not entirely sure why that is, um, but at the moment, it's you, you have to sort of come and, and live here to do, to do your PhD with us. Um, maybe that will change in the future, but I'm not sure uh, what the status of that is, if I'm honest. You would be able to get access online to journals through SOAS Library, yes. And then another question here from, from Margarida would be, would you consider doing at least one conjoint webinar session per module to make the course more interactive? So um, for all of our modules, we have webinars um, scheduled. Um, and they sometimes are about the subject matter. They're often about the exam and assignment you'll do, or they're about exam prep, or they're about meeting up and networking. Um, so for all of our modules, that will be something that we do. Um, Rob Lewis is interested in environmental impact assessments. How specific do the modules get? Um, so in the modules that we that we have, I'm just going to look at my other computer so I can see the list of, uh, of modules that we're offering. Um, we have something on environmental impact assessment in our current um, environmental management um, uh, degree program, and they're, 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 the coverage of that is expanding. Uh, I'm just, as I say, let me just see if I can bring up the, the list on another screen uh, of the ones that we are offering this year. So yeah, but I mean the modules are, are 
you, they, they are to a master's level. It's 300 hours of study per, per, per module. You read a big study guide and then you read um, key readings as well. So there's a, there's a fair amount of specificity, but it depends on the, on, on the module. And of course, there's always a, a balance to be struck between introducing um, particular topics and between, um, uh, you know, between going into them. There are always key readings, but there are then further readings that you can you can go into. Uh, so there's a there's sort of a, a chance to get as specific as you like in a way. Okay. Oh, something. We are hoping to roll out distance learning PhDs in five years. Hurrah! I didn't really ask that. That's good news. Um, in the climate change adaptation module, you will be providing guidance on managing water resources. Will this also cover disaster risk reduction? Yes, there is coverage of disaster risk reduction. In climate change adaptation, there's also coverage of it in the climate change and development module. I should know because I'm rewriting some of that coverage now for, for the module that will go live when, when hopefully when some of you guys come and study it with us uh, in October. Okay, um, I, um, oh, here we go, another question. Currently living in Bangladesh, internet is good. We are looking to move to Malawi where it's slow. Would this be an issue? So. Where it might be an issue is for the webinars. Um, these are always optional um, and they're not um, summative. That is to say, um, they, there's no marks attached to going to them and they tend to be about practical things. How do I do this exam? How do I do my exam and assignment? How do I, you know, can we all meet up and introduce ourselves and have a discussion? Sometimes they're about the substance of, of the module, but frequently not. So that's where you may struggle. But for everything else, you wouldn't because it is something you'll have two weeks to do. So as long as you have two weeks, Rob, in which you can get online at the relevant points in, in at those times, then you should be able to do um, any any assignments that, that, that you need to do, basically, and, and to post any comments that you may have. Um, so it still works even for areas of the world where bandwidth is not great. Is there a way to audit or try out a module before making a final selection, Mayada? So um, yes, there is. Um, we have, um, I'm not sure, actually I might like a bit of input here from, from, uh, from Beth because I know that we have prepared some um, stuff to give you guys, uh, one of the units from the new climate change and development module uh, in, in the new format that we're trying it out in. Uh, but Beth will be able to answer that question. Um, referring to a lecture type module, but I understand these will be about practical issues, correct? In re reference to the webinars, yes, that's correct. Okay, Jen, great to meet you. Sorry, oh, she's gone. Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> and um, Sorry, am I keeping up here? Uh, yeah, okay. Would the course be useful and informative? Jasmine to his question. Um, if already working with an international development agency on water and climate change, yes, it would, because we're going to have a water and climate change uh, element in, in our new climate change and development module, but we're also going to have an, a, a water management module and I'm guessing that whatever you know about it now would be expanded through doing that particular module. Um, and here is the link to the um, sample of the climate change and development module. Right, I don't think I've missed any questions have I? Just put up your hand or repeat the question if I have, yeah? Can I ask another question? Uh, Adam, yes, you can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I prefer talking to writing. Do you have any, do you have any physical uh, master programs in, uh, in, in this? Uh, sure. Yes? Uh, like in, in environmental, uh, or no, climate change and development on, on SOAS. Sorry, I don't think I quite got your question there. What was that? Uh, I was wondering, um, why you've chosen to do this course online, or if you also uh, have like uh, courses at the University uh, of, uh, of London in uh, climate change and development, developmental studies. Right. So we, um, why have we chosen to do this online? Um, there are existing 
um, on-campus climate change and development master's programs and um, I, guess, I guess that one of the calculations was that there was um, greater opportunity in the distance learning sector because there are master's programs you can do but there's nothing quite like this and we also um, you know the, the idea for this started in a part of SOAS in, in my department the Centre for Development Environment and Policy which is already uh, focused wholly on um, online and distance learning basically so I guess um, those are the main reasons why uh, we're, we're doing it um, as a distance learning offering. We don't have a climate change and, as I say, development master's programme at SOAS, but we have, for example, there's a master's programme at environment, politics and development, which does some elements of climate change. In fact, I'm going to be convening that from uh, not too long from now, and I'm going to be beating up the climate change um, coverage of that, but it won't become a master's in climate change and development. Does that answer your question, Adam? Yeah, yeah, I think it does. Um, but how come, uh, I'll just continue my question, like how does the, uh, the like the, um, no wait, I'll, I'll write the question instead. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure, no problem. ask there doesn't seem to be any other questions like how do you get to know the other students because that's quite a big part of being uh, mm -hmm. a student like getting to know other students and networking and uh, yeah it seems like uh, a little bit yeah it's strange not uh, meeting with people that you're interacting with yeah i mean of course you do distance learning is uh it's very different from that perspective. You can't just go into the, you know, sort of the, the refectory or whatever, the main student building, and, and hang out with your peers in, in that way. But there are lots of um, ways to do that on online these days. We have our we have our virtual learning environment, which is where a lot of the interaction can go on. What will happen is that for every module, you have a you have a discussion forum where you know, discussions related to the to the module materials and, and assignments can be started, where students can start their own interactions, where the tutor will post questions and, and uh, discussions and post you know, bits of useful information. Um, so there are, if you like, there are there are you know opportunities for interaction built in in that way, and for each module, you will have your chance to in, you know to introduce yourself both on. The discussion forum itself and through the, the the first webinar that tends to be about people just meeting up from there there are also lots of enterprising things that our students um, do and that happen in relation to particular modules so we have a module at the moment called NGO management and there's actually a LinkedIn group linked to that because there's a bunch of people who already work for NGOs who take that module and um, they, they sometimes communicate through the LinkedIn group um, and uh, sometimes we just do it through through the forum uh, itself. Sometimes there are study groups that students set up for themselves uh, to, to, you know, to, to share their thoughts on particular materials um, in addition to the structured discussions relating um, to the learning objectives of, of each module. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, yes, and questions about having missed the presentation, no problem. Okay, um, so we still have um, quite a few people here. Um, are there any other questions? Yes, there are some other questions coming on, what from Margarita, for example. Do you recommend any advanced reading list prior to October? So somebody else asked about this, um, and I think we need to have a sort of a that's something that we would send out um, once you've uh, you know we've got your application. But I can I can put in some suggestions. Uh, I'll put them into the chat box. Um, one of them is um, the uh, textbook for climate change and development module. Uh, which is also called climate change and development 
and that's by um, Tom Tanner and Leo Horn. I always struggle with the uh Pana Panfanai, I think it is. I'm just going to check online now. Yeah. Okay. So it's Tom Tanner and Horn Pathanathai. Uh, so that's one coming up in the chat box there. Um, it depends on the perspective that you want to start with. So I work a lot, for example, on climate change and agriculture, and sometimes from a political ecology perspective, um, which is a varied and broad field and, and not one that can easily be defined in, in just one way, but I guess it's the ways in which um, social, political, economic phenomena um, play into issues of environmental degradation, whether you want to see that from a political economy perspective, whether you want to do some of the sort of, I guess, the um, the post-structuralist work, you know, that sort of perspective that's come in, you know, as, as, as post-modernism has, has been playing its its way out into the 21st century, some of the new kind of um, sort of new ontological re-concentrating um, on um, sort of materialist sort of perspectives and how and how they are important, but all looking in, in the ways in which society and nature are very difficult to separate out from each other because they, to some extent, co-produce um, each other. And one of the writers who takes people pretty well through some of those issues is a guy called Marcus Taylor. He's got a book um, uh, called uh, The Political Ecology of a Climate Change Adaptation. So that's a, a good one to be looking at. Um, now, if you if you write to him, um, he said, I forget where is a, or if you look him up online first, you may find uh, a sample of the book is, is available. Um, so look him up online, and uh, that's a good person to, to, to be looking at. And then, um, of course, uh, IPT uh, fifth assessment report. Um, try the summary for policymakers or technical summary if you're feeling very brave. I'm just putting those, uh, those in as well. Um, they're easily obtained online. Just look them up. Oh, and there we go. Uh, some other ones suggested readings will be found on the module pages. Uh, so this is what we've got all, already. And this, these, these are our existing uh, modules. So you can have a little look there as well. Do the low carbon development I guess that's module address sectors, mining and industrial. Uh, no problem. Just to go back to the Bo's question then, does the carbon development uh, module have uh, sectors like mining and industrial? I think it does. I haven't seen it yet, uh, but I'm pretty sure that it must do. And there is some of that in other uh, um, modules as well, such as climate change and development. Okay, so I think I'm going to call it a day there. Um, but thank you all so much for your time. It's been really good to uh, to you know to to speak to you and and to uh, to get some uh, questions and feedback from you. And uh, we shall hopefully um, be receiving some of you um, uh, on the masters in October, or indeed uh, a little bit later on. And thank you for all of the little hand claps and. Uh, and faces indeed. So, uh, so good luck, everyone, and we shall speak anon. Bye.